so this is the last couple of wedges here of our model, right? So the seven steps, just as a recap, we started with lead, con lead conversion, and then we moved into the importance of a pre-listing package, and then we talked about the consultation itself and how that differs so much. It differs from a traditional listing presentation. Um, we talked about servicing and marketing the listing. We talked about offers and negotiations last week. And the thing that I'll tell you is when we move to this phase, when we move from getting under contract and, and taking it the rest of the way, our job changes. Our job changes from being a sales professional to a project manager. And it is a wildly different skill set. And so one of the things that we just have to really be clear about is how do we develop those project management skills and be able to be sure that we get this thing all the way to the closing table. We teach, I think for most of us in sales, we teach sales skills. And then usually what happens in a corporate setting is once the sale is done, there's another team that takes it from there. For us, we've got to be the project manager ourselves. And so Gary Keller has some words of wisdom that I'm going to throw into the mix here. Um, comes right out of the MREA. When it comes to bulletproofing the transaction, take the everything will go wrong approach. Assume that everything will go wrong and then come up with ways to possibly prevent them from happening or effectively deal with them if they do. Um, there's a chapter in the book Shift, and many of us have kind of gone back to Shift when this pandemic hit and started to really think about how, um, how we sort of adapt to a changing market. I think chapter 12 is called Bulletproofing the Transaction. And if you, if you have not taken a look at Shift, um, actually, you can go into Keller Williams University. While you can't download the book there, the Shift series, the class series is there. And I think in, in that series, I think it's session nine that talks about bulletproofing. But they go through a lot of the different areas where deals can fall apart. And we're going to do the same here today. Um, contract to close flow. There's a lot of different things that need to happen, right? Clear the title, right? Making sure that title clears. Now, guys, if you're not, you know, this is one with sellers. And so it's typically, you know, who does the title search? Well, it's the buyer's team who does the title search. And, uh, and so, but I want you to remember that when, you're, when you have an opportunity to put a deal together and you do have the opportunity to influence the title order, I'm going to really encourage you to, to use Carnegie Title or, or to recommend Carnegie Title. You know, we, we have the ability to manage how that goes, right? We have the ability to talk with everyone. If there's any hiccups, if there's any problems, we can, uh, can take care of those right away. But contract to close the flow is we've got to have a clear title, right? The underwriting has to get done. It has to get funded. We're going to talk about the places where in underwriting, uh, some of the warnings that we have to give, you know, buyers and sellers to make sure that they don't make, you know, problems, but underwriting has to get done. Um, the closing disclosures have to be done. The closing happens. And then finally, uh, we've got to record, right? We've got to record and take possession. This is just kind of the flow of things that need to happen. Again, back to Gary, words of wisdom and finding the motivated and getting to the table and creating urgency represents playing offense in the game of real estate, then bulletproofing this deal and getting it through that entire sequence is playing defense, right? And so we go into a different posture here, a defensive posture. I think the best way to play this is simply to just get a checklist. You know, there are contract to close checklists available. Um, this one right here, the listing to close checklist exists in the uh, appendix, <clears throat> I believe, of the course. This is the one with sellers course that you can download uh, right at Keller Williams University. And um, on page 167 right here is this checklist. And it's a starting point. It's a template. Keep in mind that Keller Williams is a big national company. And so the processes of, of what needs to get done are specific to your location, right? But this is a really good starting point is to download this checklist. You know, top agents really keep very systematic and they use checklists to track all the different details so that they don't miss anything. I've shared this analogy in other classes before, but you know, when you think about a commercial airline pilot and, and a good friend of mine is recently retired after flying for many, many decades, well, many decades, three decades probably. But you know, what he said was that, you know, with all the flying that he did in his career, <clears throat> probably, you know, I don't know how many routes a week, he flew a commercial airliner for, for uh, uh, US Air, I believe. 
And um, he said, you know, I, I never had an incident. And he said, you know, we go through this checklist procedure and he says, if, when you're brand new, you are so clearly aware of everything that could possibly go wrong and you're so locked in. But when you're flying forever and ever and ever, you just kind of trust that things are going to be fine. And um, if you're wrong, <laughs> it can end really badly. Um, I, I, can, I can think of some deals that I've been in with very, very experienced agents who just missed something in their checklists and it really caused complications, right? So the first thing that I'm gonna tell you is go get a checklist, right? And then take a look at the checklist and start to customize this checklist to make sure that it fits your processes, that it, that it kind of covers all the different things that are the way that deals get done in your market um, and, and work from it, right? And I, and I just know that to get into the habit of having an active checklist where you're kind of going through the steps when you're busy is just another thing to do, right? And it just seems like I don't have time for that. I've done this so many times that I can just kind of remember as I go, I'm gonna promise you that one day you're gonna get busy. One day something's gonna happen and you're gonna miss something. And, and I don't want you to be the one that finds out that you've got a problem in your airplane at 36,000 feet. That is not a good feeling, right? So keep the deal together, get a checklist, work from the checklist, right? And there's lots of different uh, lists and checklists that we've got to think about, that we've got to take a look at that can help prevent problems, making sure that we reviewed the seller's property dis disclosure and that it's complete. Um, guys, one of the things that I'm going to tell you, um, when with sellers, when you're taking a listing and the, the, uh, the homeowner fills out that six page or however many pages it is, that disclosure sheet, we have to be really clear that we're signing off that everything that they've put on there is accurate, which means we have an obligation to check. If they tell us that there's hardwood floors in the house underneath the carpeting, we have an obligation to ask permission to go into a, you know, a closet somewhere, pull back that carpet and see it and see that that wood is there because failure to do that is going to put you in a position where you're likely to get sued. And, and I don't want you to get sued. And, and if you get sued for that kind of a disclosure discrepancy, that isn't something that you're just going to be able to say, uh, errors and omissions will cover it. I just made a mistake. No, if you didn't check, you were negligent. And if you're negligent, your EO doesn't cover you anymore. Oh, and by the way, negligence is treble damages. And so it's three times the actual, the actual loss. So, so make sure that you're taking a look at that checklist, that disclosure, and you're going through it with them and you're, ver you're verifying that things are as they say that they are. And if they're not, you know, you, you gotta move on. You cannot take your listing, that listing and put yourself in that kind of risk. There's certainly uh, sometimes some disclosures that are related to the, uh, the location. Uh, some of those may include these homeowner association forms and things that we see. <clears throat> but I remember one time, selling a, uh, a property that was on a cleaned up Superfund site. And there was additional disclosures that we had to provide to show that the, you know, that the government had signed off that that site was in fact clean. Um, as it turned out, we had all the documentation. Everyone had the documentation to say that it was cleaned properly and it turned out not to be. It turned out to really still be contaminated about 15 years later. And that was a train wreck for everyone who was involved. So, so I'm praying to God that that would never happen to you. But the point is any location related disclosures, environmental disclosures, homeowners association forms, home warranty documents, right? If you're going to offer a home warranty. Now, remember new construction, new construction builders provide a home warranty and that warranty kind of has all the systems covered and they're covered for different lengths of time. Certain things fall off of that coverage at certain number of years out, and make sure that if you're, if you're selling new construction, that you've got, you know, the documentation to show that that warranty is in place. If your sellers are offering a private warranty, and there's companies out there, you know, that, that provide those third-party warranties, they probably run baselines somewhere around 500 bucks. And uh, depending on what other services that you're going to cover under that warranty, they, they may cost you a little bit more. But make sure that that documentation is, is all, you know, all in place. I've seen times where the seller offers a home warranty 
as a way of kind of navigating sort of a, a, an issue related to home condition. And then they just never go ahead and actually order it. You know, that warranty is paid for typically out of the proceeds of sale at closing. And so if that warranty documentation isn't sent to the, uh, the closing agent, um, then, then it's not going to happen. Right. And so, so don't put yourself in that spot. Pro tip on home warranties. I like them a lot, actually. I think that they really do help give buyers some sense of confidence that systems that are still working, but kind of a little long in the tooth, they're getting a little bit tired, that there can be some confidence that says, you know what, if anything happens in the first year of ownership, we're going to make sure that there's going to be a warranty. Right. Now, remember, a warranty simply means that, um, it's going to bring it back into the condition that it was at the time that you purchased the house. It doesn't say that you're going to take a, a something that's already broken and fix it, right? If they go out there and take a look at the, um, the appliance or the system that is covered under the warranty, and they determine that the reason why the hot water heater doesn't work is because somebody bashed it up with a baseball bat, well, that's not going to be covered, right? If it was broken before the house went on the market, that's not going to be covered, right? But, but the warranties, I really do like them. I think that they can really kind of grease the skids and help buyers feel more comfortable about moving forward with a house that's a little bit older or systems are a little bit older. The thing that I'm going to tell you, though, as the pro tip is this. If you as a listing agent are going to offer them, <clears throat> excuse me, if you're going to offer them or at least introduce the idea, make it a point to, to do it consistently. Put it on your checklist of things that you do introduce it consistently with everyone. And if they choose not to do it, which is perfectly fine, get a, get a sign off that you had introduced it. Most of the home warranty uh, brochures actually have a page that the homeowner would actually either accept or decline. Get that decline if they choose to not move forward. And the reason for that is there is some case law in New Jersey where agents have been sued uh, by homeowners because while the property was listed, and remember the home warranties, you put them on typically in the beginning of the listing, during the entire listing period, even though it's not paid for until closing, the entire listing period, that seller is covered under the warranty. And at the closing, it transfers over to the buyer for the next year. Well, some of the lawsuits that there's case law around in New Jersey show that sellers had a system that failed, hot water heater, who knows what, and the listing agent never introduced the idea of a warranty and they were sued for negligence for not doing that. And you look at that and you say, come on, man, give me a break. Well, the reason why it was seen as negligence was because there was some evidence that the listing agent had offered it sometimes, but not all the time. If you're going to do it at all, you just got to build it into your system of something that you do all the time. Because in one of the cases that I looked at, it got even uglier. The reason why the homeowner accused the agent of not offering the warranty wasn't simply because they were negligent. The accusation was because they were a family, a minority family. And this was not only negligence, but it was a, it was a, you know, sort of a fair housing violation. And that got really expensive. Uh, right. Can I ask a question? Go ahead. Um, this only applies if you have a listing, not if you are like helping buyers or you have to do that too. I think, I think for sure listings, right? For sure listings, because it's typically the seller who's going to provide the warranty. However, I think it's the same kind of an idea. If you're offering something that would be a benefit to your clients, do it for everybody. They don't have to take it. I, I, I just never want to be in a situation where, where someone said, Hey, how come you didn't tell me about this home warranty? I was in the house for, for three months and the dishwasher broke. And um, if you had told me about a warranty, perhaps we would have been able to get this covered. My brother just bought a house. His agent introduced the idea. How come you didn't? So I, I think it's just, it's just a checklist item, right? And just make sure you have the conversation and you have a record that it was, that it was done, right? Okay. Thank Anywho, you. Let's keep oh. moving here. The home warranties. I do love a uh, power, a uh, POA, other legal documentation. If you've got someone who is going to be signing as a power of attorney, um, make sure that documentation's in place. Uh, during COVID, when we sold my mother-in-law's house, uh, we went under contract in February. We were scheduled to close like right at the time of, of lockdown. And um, there was some discussion that perhaps she would not be able to physically 
get to the closing because it was really unclear what was going to happen. And we were debating whether or not to give the closing agent, the attorney, power of attorney, limited power of attorney, just to execute these documents. Turned out we didn't need to do that, but that's something that we think about. And then finally, the deposits and the financial documents. Make sure that you have record of, of that these deposits are coming in. You know, when you're the listing agent, remember, the thing that's really critical in terms of the money that's being held in escrow is it protects your seller. Because, you know, if the buyer decided to flake out and breach the contract, you know, there's a million places where a contract can end on its own naturally. But if the buyer just has a brain cramp and decides I want out and they breach the contract, it's the money that's sitting in the escrow account that will be the money that will pay any damages that the seller has. And so we have to make sure that there's enough there, first of all, when we're negotiating. I think we talked about that earlier in one of the other sessions. But we've got to make sure that if additional deposits are supposed to be put into that, that they're happening, right? And so it's just a checklist. You know, let's follow up with the, all the parties involved and make sure that that escrow money is showing up, okay? Be proactive with all, with everybody. Be proactive with the inspectors. Be proactive with your appraisers. Be proactive with your lenders. And, 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 you know, all the people that do the repair work and the title people, you know, you get to build your team with who you want to work with. You know, the people that you surround yourself with are an extension of your business. And if they're not delivering the goods in a way that is reflecting well on your business, they have not earned the right to keep in business with you. And so we want to be proactive and we want to have communication that I'm not waiting for Shane to call me back and tell me what's going on. I'm going to check in with him regularly and say, Hey, Shane, I just want to see, you know, what's happening here. Has the, uh, you know, have the buyers, is everything moving forward with the buyers? Uh, and, and look, you know, I don't have any problem at all. I, I do not believe it is at all inappropriate for a seller's agent to contact the buyer's lender for a status report. There is no fiduciary violation there. It is absolutely your obligation to make sure that the buyers are proceeding in a way that will get to the closing table or your seller gets hurt. And so anybody who kind of pushes back and says, you have no right to call my buyer's lender. I think they're crazy. I absolutely think they're crazy, but we want to be proactive with all of these conversations, right? Now, provide an excellent experience. Part of what we want to do is not just transactionally get the job done, but we want people to have a great experience at the same time. And so one of the areas or some of the areas that really impact the experience are, have we set reasonable expectations in the first place and then exceeded them? Where I said, I think a lot of deals fall apart is because I don't know that a lot of agents really set expectations at all in terms of what to expect at different junctures, what, what, how long to wait, you know, to expect to wait for a response on this kind of an issue or whatever it is. I think what tends to happen is we either don't set expectations or we set the expectation that there's not going to be any friction, that there's not going to be any hiccups. And I don't know about you, but for, for the, you know, I don't know how many properties I sold while I was actively selling, you know, maybe a, a hundred plus, um, I got to tell you something, very few of those, you know, went smoothly. There was always a hiccup. Once in a while, you'd get one that just seemed eerily too simple, right? Um, but you set reasonable expectations and then exceed them. Be timely. Be timely in your communications, right? And, and the thing that I'm going to tell you is when things go off the rails, when things become emotionally charged because there's problems, that's the time that we have to over-communicate. That's the time that we have to be even more proactive. And what tends to happen, because we're human beings and human nature is when I'm emotionally upset myself, when I don't want to feel this level of conflict, I want to run away. And the way that we do that sometimes as agents is our communication changes from on the phone to text or on the phone to email. Don't do that. You know, think of this as like you're a firefighter. When everyone in, in the, when there's, a, when there's an emergency and people are afraid, most people run out. The firefighter runs in. You've got to be a firefighter. And, and it is uncomfortable. But you've got to, to, to proactively get into those uh, conversations 
and, and not hide behind text message because people, when they're emotional, they will misinterpret what you wrote. They will totally misinterpret what you wrote. And, you know, they'll feel abandoned. I came out of healthcare. You guys know that. One of the things that we studied in the healthcare system that I was in was um, risk management. What could we do to try to prevent lawsuits? And as we studied lawsuits and doctors who got sued, what we found was really interesting to me, at least. What we found was the doctors that were the most likely to be sued were not necessarily the doctors that made the biggest mistakes. The doctors that were the most likely to be sued were the doctors who, when they made a mistake, they stopped communicating. They, they went AWOL. Those were the ones where the patient felt abandoned and they were angry. And you can't let that happen. So to provide an excellent experience, you know, do all those things, over-communicate, you know, anticipate places where you're going to expect that the emotions are going to get charged up a little bit. We know that when the homeowner has to deal with home inspections and the buyer's going to come in and ask them to correct things, we know that that's going to be a time when emotions are going to be a little bit higher. And so we've got to be ready for that, right? I do believe in doing something unexpected. We, we are in a transactional business, which means that the things that we do follow sort of that checklist pattern. There's a sequence to what we do. And, and quite honestly, it's hard to differentiate yourself sometimes in transactional businesses. You know, we, we, we kind of work through the checklist and we make sure that deposit money show up and we make sure that the inspections happen and the appraisals happen. We probably can't do that any better really than anyone else. And so managing the transaction, being a project manager, shepherding it from beginning to end, it's not really a place that you're going to be able to separate yourself unless you insert some things into your processes that nobody expected. Things that added value, and I'm going to say things that add just an emotional, um, uplifting little charge, unexpected little things. We'll talk about a couple of those in a minute. Um, but do things that are unexpected and, and people will say, wow, that was really, that was really cool. I can't believe that you did that, right? There's a book over my shoulder over there written by Seth Godin. Um, Seth is one of the marketing gurus of our generation, at least. And uh, the book is called Purple Cow. And if you ever have a chance to read it, it's only like this thick. It's a super easy book. And, and what I love about his analogy about a purple cow is he says, you know, cows as a rule are pretty boring, they're black and they're white and they're brown. And they have spots. And you've seen one, you kind of seen them all. And yet, if you were driving across the highway or down the country lane and you looked over into the pasture and you saw a cow that was purple, you'd stop the car. You'd take pictures. You'd put it up on Facebook right away or Instagram because a purple cow is, is remarkable, right? It is so different that you just can't wait to tell people about it. That's what remarkable means. It means worthy of talking about right? And so when you do unexpected little things, your business becomes remarkable. And we've got to engineer those right in to our processes. I think there are some companies out there that are really well known for creating a world-class experience. Can you think of any in the, either in, in any industry? It doesn't matter. Think of companies. I'd love to have somebody unmute or put in chat. A company that you know of that maybe you've done business with or has a reputation for just creating a world-class experience? Anybody? The Four Seasons Hotel? Four Seasons Hotel, for sure. One of them, absolutely. The Ritz-Carlton. Ritz-Carlton, you're right up there. This isn't Motel 6, right? These are really world-class experiences. And, and I'll tell you, I, I had a personal experience one time with the Four Seasons Hotel. And, and I talked about it in, in, in a previous session, I think, where I watched the concierge kind of diffuse a very unhappy guest where something had gone off the rails and I couldn't tell what because I could only sort of see from a distance. But I watched the concierge stay cool and calm and, and when everyone else would want to run away, she just you know leaned in and she solved this problem. And I watched the guest, I watched her go from kind of flushed in the face angry to kind of softer and then finally smiling. And later on in the day when I did have an opportunity to speak to that concierge and I said to her, look, you know, I'm, I'm sort of in the service business myself and I just, I don't know exactly what that was about, but I will tell you that I was impressed with whatever you did because I saw how she changed and I saw how you took a bad situation and turned it into a better one. 
And what she said was really interesting. What she said was, you know, one of the things that we do here at the Four Seasons to really try to make sure that we can always live up to the expectation that we portray is we kind of brainstorm on a regular basis. What are all the things that could go wrong? It's that bulletproofing idea where all the things that a guest could get jammed up and, and have a problem. And we just kind of throw them all up against the wall and we say, okay, this happened. What would be the best solution? How could we solve that one? And she said, you know, we're always ready. She says, I, I, I wasn't sure when someone was going to present this problem, but I knew that sooner or later someone would. And when they, when they did, I had a, a place to go. I had a solution ready. And, and that's what causes companies like that to always, always, always exceed their peers. They provide an excellent experience. Be mindful of gatekeepers, right? Now, what do I mean by a gatekeeper? Who would, who would be a gatekeeper that could potentially create a problematic experience? Real estate attorneys. Real estate attorneys could be a gatekeeper or the paralegal could be a gatekeeper. You think about a gatekeeper in the old days, right? There was a gate to get into the castle and there was a gatekeeper who would either let you win or wouldn't. And, and that's why it's so important to partner with our affiliated partners like our lenders and our title people because we don't have to go through gatekeepers, right? Build relationships with all the key gatekeepers in your world. You know, think about who is at the building department in, in your municipality. Think about who is going to be doing the certificate of occupancy inspections in the towns where you're taking listings. Kind of make a friend. Get to know these folks. And, 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 and it can't ever be get to know them in an adversarial way, right? Because, um, you know, we've had some problems and we're always yelling at each other. No, make a friend, grease the skids, and, and be sure that you've got good relationships with people who can kind of make things easier. And then finally, the, the other folks that we have to make sure we're taking care of is our own back office. If you've got your own transaction coordinators, if you've got um, in your market centers, Certainly, people like your MCAs, your brokers, the people that have to review these files and make sure that they're complete, you know, take care of them, you know, have a checklist, a document checklist, and be sure that your files are complete so that when your broker reviews it, they don't have to send you a message that says, we still need signatures on these 12 documents. Because then it gets into a real tussle. Nobody, nobody, nobody wants you to wait a minute for your, for your well-earned commission check. And yet we know we, we've, got a, we've got an obligation in order to stay in business with the Real Estate Commission. We've got to have these records. And so keep in mind, you know, we're all pulling together. Take good care of your back office um, and you kind of get the idea. All right. I told you I was going to talk about mortgage funding and some of the things that we have to make sure that buyers don't do. Now, remember, this is when with sellers, and so this is sometimes a conversation that we have with the co-broke agent. And I'll, and I'll tell you, um, there was, when we sold my mother-in-law's house, right? I didn't actually sell it myself. I hired a friend of mine who was the number one agent in the town where my mother-in-law lived, who was a rock star, owns her own brokerage, absolutely superstar agent. And um, I'll share a little bit later when we get to the closing, there was a problem. And there was a problem because there was a conversation that never happened. And as a result, the buyer did the wrong thing. And it, it really caused some problems. But what are the things that buyers could do that could hurt your sellers and delay the closing? Well, number one, don't, don't, buyers can't change jobs, right? Not until the closing. I, I, I have had that happen where people were transferring from one place to another, which was why they were moving. And many times they were transferring jobs or getting a new job at a higher salary. And you can't leave that job unless you are sure that you can start in the new one and have enough pay cycles that when they do the final check of, of purchase, you know, at closing, in order to fund, they've got to make sure that you're currently employed and that you're currently been employed for a, a period of time. And so we, we encourage people to not change jobs. Don't make any major purchases, right? Jack up your credit. Don't, don't increase your credit card debt. Don't change bank accounts just because you're moving. You know, a changed bank account will have a significant impact on your credit score, which could complicate an underwriter's ability to fund that loan. Don't apply for new credit. Don't spend, don't spend the money <laughs> that you need for closing, right? 
Don't be delayed in providing financial paperwork. And so it's not your job as the listing agent to micromanage the buyer's agent. I do believe it is our job to be in communication with the buyer's agent and develop the kind of report that you can just have update conversations. You know, nobody wants to have somebody telling them or looking over their shoulder and telling them what to do and telling them how to do their job. But I think a really good agent sort of starts out right from the very beginning with their, with their Cobrook and says, you know, the way I like to work is I, I just like to have regular open communication. And I want you to know that if there's anything that you need to get done, that you're running into some challenges with or some deadlines, call me. If I can help you out in any way, if, you know, maybe it's the time for the appraiser to come and take a look uh, at the house. If you can't meet the appraiser, give me a call. I'll see if I can do it. Whatever. I'm going to try to establish a partnership right out of the gate. And in that ongoing communication, I'm going to talk about these things. I'm going to talk about these things. Hey, just want to be sure. Have you kind of coached your buyers and want to make sure that the buyers know all the different things that they shouldn't be doing right now until they get to the closing table where we got jammed up in my mother-in-law sale was over wire fraud. Because uh, as you guys know, wire fraud is becoming a bigger and bigger issue. And on the emails of most of your attorneys, if not all, there is probably a, a rider on the very bottom that talks about wire fraud. There's a wire fraud disclosure notice, I believe as part of the paperwork that just reminds people, please, do, please, please do not wire funds without actually speaking to the person that you're wiring them to and confirming that that information is correct. What happened in my mother-in-law cell was the night before the closing, or actually a couple of days before the closing, the buyers got an email from a bogus entity. We, we've never figured out who it was claiming to be their attorney. And the email signature was an exact copy um, the, the, the kind of the tone of the language was as if they had read enough emails back and forth to kind of get a sense of how that language would be used. The only difference was that the email address was wrong and it wasn't wrong by much. The email address that the attorney was using was first name at, you know, the attorney, the attorney's law firm, right? And the only thing that they did was they just changed a letter in that email address instead of saying the Smith company law firm. They just made it the Smith companies with an S law firm buried in the email signature. No one, no one, no one would have looked at that email address and, and, and said, gee, the 13th character there doesn't look familiar to me. And as a result, they wired the remainder of their deposit money that they were supposed to come to the closing with. They wired it offshore. It was gone. $75,000 gone. Boom. Just like that. And so um, fortunately for us, we were able to, there was another family member that was willing to lend them the remainder of that money, but it required us to then have that money gifted and then it had to season for a little bit of time and it pushed the closing back for pretty much a month, right? And when this happened, my friend, the rock star agent said, you know what? I never had that conversation. Maybe this is a conversation that I should be having with my buyers more often. I'm like, yeah, I think so. It's just a checklist item. It's got to happen, right? Be careful about wire fraud. Seize the golden opportunity here, right? Your agent, you have two agenda to move the current transaction towards a successful closing and then get referrals. You know, most agents forget to try to get referrals. I think they organically believe that, um, that if they do a good job, that people are just going to give them referrals. It's not really the way it works. I'm going to go back to being proactive be proactive with all the other partners in this transaction, but be proactive about asking for referrals. Um, and we'll talk more about that in a second. But I think we need to celebrate milestones. I think in terms of creating a great experience, I think in terms of um, kind of um, keeping the energy good, when we overcome a hurdle, rather than just check it off, I think a little celebration is, is a cool thing to do. You decide, right? But, but I think about, you know, when we have little kids and we're, our kids are growing up and every time they do something new, right? We have, it's like a party, right? The, you know, baby crawls for the first time. Baby starts to, you know, stand up and starts to, you know, cruise around holding onto the table and holding onto the chair. Like in every little de developmental growth spurt change 
we put it on Facebook, we capture the pictures, it's such a big party. Well, I think our real estate transactions have these developmental cycles that they go through, right? And there's different hurdles that have to be overcome all the way through. And when they're done, I think it's appropriate to have a little party. Now you decide what that means, right? But I, I, I mean, I've seen sometimes agents do things like, you know, send a bouquet of flowers when they have solved all the problems in uh, home inspections or, or whatever. I, you decide what feels right. But I do think that doing something like that really does a couple of key things. Number one, it differentiates you. When we talk about doing unexpected things, these are the little things that we're talking about. And um, I also think they just keep the energy in a good spot. You know, when you think about um, what I sometimes call the piggy bank of goodwill in the very beginning of the transaction, there's goodwill between all the parties. And as things get complicated, there's a withdrawal that's made from that little piggy bank. These kinds of little celebrations put deposits back in and you're going to need to sometimes because there's always going to be hiccups. There's always going to be problems, right? But let's go back to referrals for a second. I don't want you to forget to ask. And so I think what you want to do is, is think about when is the best time to ask our sellers or our buyers, any of our clients, when is the best time to be asking for a referral? Do you have any thoughts about that? Anybody who could, would be willing to unmute and just kick some ideas around? Julia, I see your question in chat. I'll get it to a second. Any, any ideas about when's the best time? to ask for a referral? Uh, for me, uh, no, good afternoon. For me, I, I usually ask my buyers, uh, uh, you know, right after closing. So usually I, what I do is I invite them for coffee or for, I treat them to lunch or dinner. And yeah. then, uh, and then I, I ask them in a subtle way, you know, if you don't mind any referrals, you know, that would be nice. No. You know, I'm going to encourage you to, um, within your comfort zone, find a way to be even more direct than that. I think you can be less subtle. You know, to, you have to decide what fits your temperament and things like that. But the, I think the best time to ask for a referral is either while you're still in the transaction or immediately afterwards. And the reason for that is that um, while you are in a transaction, whether you're on either side, the buyer or the seller, it's kind of the center of your life. It's taken on a big prominence in, what's going on in your world. And so what ends up happening is that when you're talking to people who are in your world and they know that you're in the middle of a transaction, the real estate, the conversations tend to be about real estate. Hey, how's that going? How's your sale going? You know, you're still on track for a closing. And because there's a real estate context for that conversation, it's easier for them to begin to share other people that they know who are having real estate deals. You know what? My brother's thinking about selling his house too. You know, did you find it was a good time to be on the market? You know, cause my brother's thinking about doing that. Well, if you're going to ask your clients to think about who they know that is needing a real estate agent, when the people that they know are more likely to have real estate related conversations, you'll just get a better return you'll get a better referral. The longer you wait after the transaction closes, um, the more likelihood is that people are gonna get back into their own life and those real estate related conversations just aren't gonna happen anymore. I, I use the analogy sometimes of, of a, a woman who's pregnant and I have a couple friends right now who are very, very pregnant and I look on their Facebook and I see all the pictures, right? Standing there with the shirt up and the belly and the, and the mirror and all that stuff showing how many more weeks till the baby's due and all that stuff. Well, when you're not visibly pregnant like that, people don't naturally come up and have baby conversations. And yet what I've experienced, not that I've ever been pregnant, I've been a lot of things, that ain't one of them. But when I watch, when my wife was pregnant, People would come up and because she was so noticeably pregnant, they would start to have conversations around babies. It's the same idea. And so we want to leverage this and ask for the referrals during the transaction. Now, there's a right time and a wrong time. We think about the developmental cycles, right? Probably in the midst of an emotionally charged time like negotiating home inspections, probably not, not the right time, right? But probably the better time is if we're gonna celebrate, 
overcoming those little developmental cycles in some way. I think those little celebrations, the little bouquet of flowers or, or a bottle of wine to celebrate that we, that we, the buyers got their mortgage commitment or whatever it is, something unexpected that just kind of is cool that they're like, damn, that was really neat. I, I'm, I, I can't believe you're so thoughtful. That triggers what we call the law of reciprocity, right? What's the law of reciprocity? The law of reciprocity is just the way that the human brain is designed to work. We do not like things to be unbalanced in any way. If I came up to you and said, hey, my name is Hal, what's yours? You're likely gonna be giving me your name. If I started to sing happy birthday, happy birthday to you, happy birthday to you, and I get all the way to the end and I finish it like this, happy birthday, dear Hal, happy birthday to it, it's going to kill you. You're waiting for that freaking last note. We do not like things to be unbalanced. And so when we do things, when we do things that are nice and special, and we do things that these little celebratory things that I'm talking about, what happens is people feel the sense of that's really cool. How can I repay you? Do you hear where I'm going? Well, the way you repay me is who do you know that I could serve in such in the same way, right? So get strategic about this. These are checklist items. I'm going to make sure that I've engineered those little special moments that when we have a, a little developmental place in the transaction completed, I'm going to do something unique and special to make you feel good. And when I do that, you're going to call and thank me. And that's the time. That's the time because the law of reciprocity is working in your favor and because they're still having real estate related conversations with their friends. That's the sweet spot. Right. Mm -hmm. Any questions around that? Thank you. Thank okay. You. Your preferred vendor database, you know, again, monitor, monitor the folks that, uh, that, that you're, you know, letting your clients use. If there's a, you know, a moving company or, or whoever, and for some reason people are starting to have bad experiences, you've got to either hold them accountable and say, look, you know, I trusted you with my client. And um, what are you going to do to make this right? Otherwise, you know, you can't be my partner anymore. It's just the way it's going to be, right? Reward top performers with new business and people that underperform, get them off your team, right? Just get them off your team. Um, contract to close ratios, something that we need to be tracking. And we can do that right here in command. We want to be able to, as a business person, know what percentage of my listings that I get out of a Turner review actually close. I told you the national average right now is about one out of four fail. I think that is way too high. And I think if you're proactive and you bulletproof and you anticipate and you do special things to refill that piggy bank of goodwill, you're gonna keep more deals together for sure. But it's really important to know what the numbers tell us because at the end of the day, we can only fund our life with the proceeds of closings. And so we have to know what's the series of events that has to happen to get to a closing. And we work our way backwards. If I find that myself, one out of every four deals that I get under contract don't close, and I find that out of, for myself, one out of every five listings that I take doesn't even get a contract, I can kind of do the math and kind of recalculate how many listings do I really need to get in order to get the income that I need? Because, you know, that's what a business person does. They track their numbers and we can do that right here in command. And so I'm going to encourage you to, to do that, right? All right. Last eight minutes. This is a little bit briefer here. We're going to move into um, post-close. What do you do next, right? What do you do next? Um, you really want to recognize the lifetime value of a client. And when you think about it this way, let's assume that we're working with a first time buyer and the first time buyer buys their house and they move in. And how frequently does NAR tell us that the average person moves? How, how many years? I mean, there's a certain percentage of people that move at one year, two years, three years, five years. But do you know what the big sweet spot is right now in terms of what's the most common number of years people are in their home before they sell? Five to seven years. It's actually now 10. It's longer. It's 10. And, and part of the reason for that 
really is still uh, sort of rebounding out of the the big collapse of the housing market in the world economy in 2008. So many people who bought a home between 2008 and 2012 found that the value of their house once they purchased it kept going down. And it was really in 2012, probably around the third quarter when home values in New Jersey started to climb back up again. And it was just a slow climb. And so people who would historically have probably moved every seven or eight years, you bought a house in maybe like 2010, 2017 would have been the year that you're ready to go. You didn't reclaim enough equity to do it. You needed to stay a little bit longer. And it, 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 right now it's about 10. And, and that number kind of goes back and forth, but it's usually in that seven to 10 range. Well, here's the thing. If a first time home buyer buys their first house and they stay in it for 10 years, and let's assume maybe a first time home buyer is 30. And then when they live in the house till they're 40 and they're buying their next house, now they're a seller and a buyer and they're moving up to the next house, which maybe they live in until they're in their 50s. And then they, or maybe somewhere along the line, they got the bigger job and the bigger income. And now they're kind of buying an even bigger house and they're a seller and a buyer again. And at some point they're gonna be downsizers and they're gonna be sellers and then maybe renters or maybe buyers. And so it's not just one deal, it's a lifetime of deals here. Not only that, it's a lifetime of referral business as well. And so we just have to make sure that we stay engaged. We just have to make sure that we stay engaged and we don't cut off the opportunity for that logarithmic growth, right? When you think about what other professionals do, they actually have a practice. You think about a doctor or a dentist or an attorney or a CPA. At the end of their career, what they've built by nurturing a community of goodwill is people that like them and people that trust them and people that can count on them. And when the time comes that they want to step away from their business, they have something that's worth something. They can sell their practice or they could actually hire somebody to run their practice and they just step out of it, right? And get the royalties still because they still own the practice. I would love for real estate agents to think that way to think about building a practice over your lifetime that has real value that you could sell to someone else. And I know agents who've done this, or you could step out of it and have people run it and your business continues to run while you go on and pursue other things. And so what that really means is that we just have to have a system of how do we nurture those relationships and, and how do we stay in touch? I think it's really important that we get testimonials because social proof is one of the best ways that we can kind of build a practice that people trust. And so we've got to kind of make sure that we build into our checklists again, not just asking for referrals, but we're going to be asking for reviews, right? Would you review our business? Personally, I think myself and a lot of people right now in the real estate industry really look to Google as being one of the best places to capture your real estate uh, referrals. And the reason for that is it's the first page that people see. And so take a step back for a second. If you have not registered your real estate business on Google, go ahead and do it, right? You can go out there as an independent practitioner. You can register your business. Uh, it, it'll be registered under your name, right? Hal Benz, uh, salesperson, Keller Williams, Realty, whatever it is. And you're going to actually register that on Google. And what happens is when people search for you on Google and do a Google search, and that comes back, that right page panel on the screen that has the picture of the business and the time that the business is open, all that stuff. That's what I want to have for you. And if you don't know how to register your business, easiest way to do is just go on to um, YouTube. Just go on to YouTube and, and just Google how to do it. Because, or, or YouTube how to do it, I guess. Because who owns YouTube? Google does. And there's a million little tutorials on how to do this. Super easy. But what I find is Google reviews kind of push your rankings higher on Google <laughs> and it just works better. You know, you can put them in a lot of places. You can have people give you reviews on Facebook. You can have people give you reviews on your Zillow page or your realtor.com page. I think what the best practice around this is pick, a, pick one bucket. We don't want to fragment those reviews. I want a lot of reviews, not some over here, some over here, some over here. I want them all in one place. And I want to put that place, the easiest place for you to see. And for right now, I think it's, it's Google. But the thing that we have to remember 
is that reviews will not happen organically. The only person who will give you a, a natural organic review, who will naturally feel the inclination to go online and write about you, is likely the person who you've disappointed. And that's not going to be a good review. And so what we need to make sure of is that we're encouraging people, we're asking people, we're following up with people. We may even have to coach people a little bit on how to give a review. I know some agents who actually write the review and say to the person, would you type this in? Would you sign off on this? I'm not a fan of that, but I look, people do what they want to do. I'm a bigger fan though of, of just making sure that people understand what a good review sounds like, because think about yourself when you're buying a product and you review, you know, things that don't have any kind of detail, things that don't have any kind of meat to them, they're not really that useful. And so a client that says, you know, I worked with Hal, he helped us sell the house. He was really nice. You know, it was a really fun experience. I'd, look, I'd use him again. I look, it's better than no review at all, but it's not as good a review as someone who kind of talks about some of the hurdles that we overcame. You know, working with Hal was a great experience. You know, it, the, the market was really challenging. There were a lot of um, things that, that, that came up. Uh, in the financing that, that we thought for a while there, the deal was going to fall apart, but he was able to keep it together. Reviews that have that kind of detail are, are just better, right? And so while I'm not a fan of writing them, I am a fan of coaching people in terms of what a consumer would want to read and then making sure that it happens. And you're going to find, because when I look at some of the transaction managers on some of the bigger teams around the country that own this part of the business, they do this follow-up, it's not uncommon to have to go back two, three, four times. And you don't wanna be a nudge, but you just wanna make sure it happens. So, so ask for that review early, quickly, right? Again, like anything else, once people get on with their lives, it's gonna be harder and harder to get. But what we know is that when you follow up with customers and, and the question is asked, how would you likely use your agent again? 70% of the folks say, absolutely sure, and yet, how many times do they really do it? It really drops off. How many recommendations do you get? It really starts to drop off. And so these responses have to sort of be, they just have to be kind of engineered, okay? Smart plans are the way to do it. Build out your smart plan that once the transaction closes, I've got a post-closing past customer smart plan that just maps out. What do I do first? What do I do second? What do I do third? I would probably run that smart plan out maybe six months or 12 months, and then repeat it. Just repeat it, right? But smart plans are the way to do that, to make sure that you don't lose touch, that you don't lose the relationship. So that said, I have one minute on my clock, so I'm gonna move this last part really quick. The winner's day. Imagine yourself a year from now, you walk into your office on Monday morning and you see a stack of leads that you're going to call. You call each one, connecting with them effortlessly, saying all the right things, exploring how you're going to help. You're confident that you'll set the appointment with many of them. And after your calls, you have five appointments booked and a solid follow-up plan for the rest. In fact, you have already done your homework on each of these sellers and you know what's pricing you're going to recommend. All of your appointments go well and you assign all of them except for one, which you didn't feel would be a great fit for you, so you referred to another agent. Four new clients in a week is a pretty big win that boosts your motivation. Your motivation's even higher as you attend two closings that afternoon. Right? That always motivated me. You know, that feeling of motivation just propels you. And so what would it be like for you to have a day like this of all the different elements of the seven-step model? What are the places, right? You think back to this model and um, what you focus on expands, right? Marcus Buddingham says, what you focus on expands. You go back to this model and you start to think about of all these different places, what could I do at the lead conversion spot to up my game? What could I do at the pre-listing spot to up my game? What could I do at listing consulting to up my game? Every one of these steps, what's the one thing that I can do to improve my listing game. When I do that, and um, it's not, remember, it's not just one thing. It's really one thing at a time. You're not gonna make a million changes all at once, but you are gonna make key ones. And you go back and you think about it and you take action and you think about every step along this way. And then you get some accountability. Who's gonna hold you accountable? Make no mistake, 
You can't do it alone. Having an accountability partner doesn't have to be a professional coach, can just be a partner in your success. Someone who you're checking in with on a regular basis to say, this is what I'm doing to grow my listing side business. This is what I intend to do this week. And you get a chance to check in with them and ask and answer the question, what did you really do? How did that go? You know, did it go the way that you wanted to? What could you have done differently? That's the kind of accountability relationship that really kind of helps you get in the right headspace. Because we know that your head and your beliefs causes you to have emotions. And those emotions are going to drive the actions that you take. If you're feeling great, you're going to take a very different set of actions than if you're not feeling great in most instances. And your actions is what brings your results. And the results are going to kind of refuel the way you think about things. Now, the thing I'm just going to close with is you don't have to act only when you feel good. We know that beliefs in getting our head in the right space. When I'm in the right head space, I take, I have a good feeling and I take the right actions. You know, the truth is sometimes you can act your way into feeling better. Sometimes you can just take the action, have a different result and have it change the way that you think about things. You know, um, and so don't wait until you're in the right head space to take these actions. Just act. The action is what transforms things. So we're going we're gonna to park it there. We're going to park it there for today. That is kind of the wrap up on, on Winwood Sellers. And so I am going to ask for people to just take another 30 seconds or so and just unmute some feedback, any ahas, any feedback about this course or any ahas of things that maybe you're thinking that you might do differently in your business at different points in the seven step cycle. I'd love to hear from about two or three people before we shut it for today. The idea of uh, doing something unexpected, something nice, uh, and exceeding the expectations, because I think even though I've been doing it for a while, um, I mean, I just do my job, but I don't necessarily think about um, being like, I don't know, outstanding in a way, like I, I am outstanding in what I do, but I feel like that going that extra step and doing something that yeah, not just yeah. expected of you, but extra, that flat. That's the one, Julia, that's it. <laughs> That's it. You know what? In the, in the course, the customer experience, there's a video of a, a buyer talking about his experience with his agent. And he said, you know, I got the house that I wanted. I got it at my price and terms in the neighborhood that I wanted. And the moderator said, well, that sounds like a great experience. Would you use that agent again? And he said, nah, probably not. And he said, you know, why? It sounded like you got everything I wanted. He said, you know, look, she, she did a good job. She did what I paid her, what she got paid to do. She got me the house, but she didn't do anything special. That's the reality of what it's like to work with consumers. And so if we're not figuring out how to engineer special into the game, we're not going to thrive. We're just not. And so think about how to do it. It doesn't take much, but it takes intention. It does take intention. Any others? Hal, you were talking about the uh, fiduciary responsibility to your seller, and uh, those lists just seem to be so uh, critical because, yeah. you know, if you're very successful there, it's just going to lead probably to a better network from that seller in the future, but uh, a you lot know, of T's and I's to cross. You know, I'm going to go back to my healthcare days. Um, I'm going to tell you, you know, I, I never spent any time in a surgical operating room, but I have some nurses and doctor friends who are surgeons. You know, when the surgery is, is the procedure's done, frequently the doctor leaves and someone else kind of closes up. Trust me, there's a checklist. They are accounting for every sponge. They are accounting for every clamp. They are accounting for everything. Because God forbid, <laughs> you got to go back in because you left something in, right? That's what I'm talking about. These, they're just too critical to not have. 